and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. What is the condition of the Minsk Agreement 2.0 that halts Ukraine's civil war? Has it ever been respected, and who openly defies it? Should we expect hostilities to resume anytime soon? And if they do, will the Kiev regime survive? To Crosstalk Ukraine, I'm joined by my guest, Dmitry Babich. He is a political analyst with Sputnik International. We also have Mark Sloboda. He is an international affairs and security analyst. And we cross to Alexei Kolebnikov. He is the senior editor for Russia Direct, as well as a political risk analyst. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules affect that. You can jump in anytime you want. Mark Sloboda, um, I opened up with what is the condition of Minsk 2.0 that has halted the civil war to this point? There have been violations on, on the ground. But where does it sit right now? Okay, well, there, Minsk II is an illusion. The Civil War is not halted at this point. The degree of shelling of the cities of the Donbass has gone down to a certain degree, but they're still daily fighting, daily, hourly fighting. Uh, and in the past few weeks, a uh, return to an increased amount of shelling. Um, there are 13 provisions of the Minsk II agreement. Uh, anyone can look these up on Wikipedia. I very much encourage you to do so. They're very simply written. Um, out of these 13 agreements, I can definitively say that 12 of them are not being met. And the only one, uh, the other one, the 13th, is because that it cannot be met until one of the prior provisions <laughs> is met. Okay. All right. Uh, th the biggest obstacle to the Minsk agreements, besides the, the continued uh, fighting on the ground, is that the regime in Kiev, the West Bank regime, refuses uh, a principle, the, one, one of the, the most important um, elements of the Minsk Agreement that suffuses the whole thing, that they must sit down and have a dialogue and political compromise with the representatives of the people of the Donbass. They refuse to do so. The West is not pushing them to do so. Okay. And um, uh, the reason for this is that because they have built up this national hysteria in the Ukraine with their prop rank and uh, uh, instruments there. The minute they sit down uh, and enter a political argument or, or dialogue with the people that they have been calling terrorists then and they, Russian invaders for, for the last year and a half, their regime will completely collapse and everything they have been saying to the Ukrainian people will be exposed as a lie for the last year and a half. Dima, but when, when the, the sanctions were renewed against Russia for another six months, and, and if you listen to what came out of the State Department, it's because Russia isn't fulfilling its obligation to Minsk too. Now, I'm, I, I agree with Mark. Please. I, I encourage our, our viewers to read it because Russia is not obligated to do anything whatsoever in uh, that uh, agreement. agreement. It, it is supposed to be a monitor. It is supposed to be part of the, a, a process, but it's not obligated to, one, to do one specific thing. Nonetheless, Russia is being blamed for the lack of progress with Minsk II. Well, well the whole idea of the Minsk agreements is that uh, the Ukrainian government regains control over uh, the, you know, the whole length of its border with Russia. At the very last step. At the very last step, in exchange for giving a special status uh, to the regions in the east. Uh, it's not, you know, the word autonomy is not mentioned, but uh, some kind of a special status. The economic blockade must be lifted before, uh, you know, uh, the Kiev regime resumes control over the border with Russia and a number of other conditions. On the, uh, you know, uh, they were all supposed to be fulfilled by the Ukrainian side. So the Ukrainian side has not fulfilled a single condition. But we never hear any criticism we from never Western hear capitals, from, from the State from, Department. Especially Go ahead, from jump the in. EU. I mean, what is the condition of Minsk? Yeah, I mean, I just want to highlight that uh, actually the Normandy 4 format uh, still working and it was working and it works and I hope it will work. So first of all, the discussions are ongoing. So last week, uh, foreign ministers of Russia, Ukraine, Germany and France met in Paris. And actually you could, I mean, they expressed their concerns that both parties violate uh, Minsk agreements. Mm. So actually there is critique from uh, Western part. But I mean, uh, on the other hand, uh, Poroshenko uh, continuously uh, telling that Ukraine tightly uh, observes the implementation of Minsk agreement. 
So there is kind of dichotomy between well, the that's, Western that's, bank that's, backers that's, well, that's and that's, that's, that's nonsense. This you can't have it both because, ways. Go ahead. Because instead of giving a special status to Donetsk and Lugansk regions, they do have a special status. They They're being them, shelled. Okay? They gave them a special status of being, uh, you know, they call them occupied territories, occupied naturally by Russia. And when you mentioned that Russia has no obligations under the Minsk agreements, you know, the only obligation that Poroshenko and the West want to be fulfilled is, you know, that Ukraine, the, 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 Minsk, uh, the, the Ukrainian government would resume control over the border between Russia mm -hmm. and Donetsk and But Lugansk. that is the last But that is yeah. the last. Yeah. And instead of easing the blockade uh, of Donetsk and Lugansk, just a week ago, Mr. Poroshenko started sp uh, sp talking not just about an economic blockade, but also about a food blockade uh, on television in and, Kiev. And these are two, these are two obelisks that they want part to be part of Ukraine, Ukraine again. Mark, explain. Three how, million people how, under a food blockade. Okay, under a food blockade. You, they, they still yeah. want them to be back into a unitary Ukraine. How yeah. can that happen? It, it absolutely can. All right. For, for a year now, they have denied the people of Donbass their social security, their pensions, vital medicines, uh, medicines that keep elderly people alive. Um, they have instituted a full economic and, as D uh, Dmitry Babich said, food blockade now, which has just in the past few days been now applied to the Crimea as well. Um, uh, the OSCE promised to do something about this economic blockade, which is completely against um, the Minsk protocols, but it is also, more importantly, it's a war crime. It is a war crime to deny food and vital medicines, uh, not only to, to a civilian population, but a civilian population that the West Bank regime in Kiev claims the right to rule over. Instead, they have completely abdicated responsibility uh, okay. for these people. Okay, and so you said that, you know, that we still have this format that met in Paris. So, I mean, what kind of pressure is um, being applied on the uh, Kiev regime to fulfill its obligations to the Minsk Accord here because I don't see it in any way. We have two guests sitting here saying that it's not being implemented at all. Not, not one element of that accord is being implemented right now. It could take a phone call from Washington, D.C., and I know which office. It's from the Under Secretary of State for European Affairs. Mm -hmm. Could change all of this. <laughs> Why doesn't that happen? So, first of all, I want to say that there is uh, two things, separate things rhetoric and uh, actual uh, policies, actual steps which countries implement. So, of course, both. Uh, European leaders and uh, American leadership, they have leverage to uh, use over uh, the government in Why Kiev. Why isn't it being applied? Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to answer because, uh, one, uh, on one hand, it could be that uh, both the U.S. and the EU, they don't have any strategy towards the conflict itself, so they don't know what to pursue, what steps to accomplish. But they're still sending, so NATO trainers are still going there. The U.S. is sending tanks there. The U.S. is fortifying the borders of Europe, uh, of NATO countries on Russia's border and Ukraine's border, and they don't have a strategy. Mark? Yeah. Um, the, uh, there is a strategy right now. They are hoping that um, uh, Russia is will... Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. Demonization isn't a strategy <laughs> either. I, okay? Between Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, I, I see uh, Libya, I see nothing but hope as the, the primary strategy of American foreign policy for the last uh, uh, two decades. Hope and, 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 and some kind of messianic ideological uh, belief in the magical power of, of, of Western-style uh, democracy being forced on people, but um, these um, uh, uh, military uh, strategy that, that, that the U.S. has is hoping that Russia, economic pressure on Russia, which has clearly failed, the sanctions have failed, other types of uh, economic pressure, the, the reduction uh, in access to uh, international capital have failed. Um, the, the, the issue at this point is both the West and Russia, neither one of them has a, an effective plan B at this point. Mm, that's right? a good point. Uh, both sides. The, 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 the West was counting on a complete military victory in Donbass and for Russia to back down. That is not going to happen. Mm. Um, Russia uh, was hoping that the uh, European countries would eventually apply, uh, put pressure on the Kiev regime, some kind of political compromise that protected Russia's interest in the Donbass. But, but that would still result. could that, happen. That still could happen. I find it extremely unlikely, both uh, in Russia's, uh, the Kremlin's, I believe, naive and misplaced faith in what they call 
their European I don't partners think that, at this I think point? That, I think that belief was destroyed on February 22nd last year. Go ahead, Dean. Well, I think that there is still a belief in Russia, even in the Kremlin, that the West would pursue its pragmatic interests mm. and, and the return to some kind of a dialogue uh, with Russia and maybe even well, with the minorities in Ukraine. Apparently they have, but on different issues. That's what <sighs> well, this is, this is the problem. I think that in the last 10 years at least, the West in many ways acted against its own interests, mm. in many cases. So I think this strategy is, is not going to be very successful. But, Dima, but isn't what they constantly accuse Russia of doing, of acting yeah, against its own interests? In, in fact, you know, I think that Russia cannot have a plan B in this situation, because what are the plan? Uh, what are the alternative plans to to start a, uh, to start a war and to invade Ukraine? Russia doesn't want to do it, a and it would be suicidal. And Putin never had such a plan. Now it would be suicidal. Yeah. To last March, it would have been okay. An entirely last, different. Last scenario. March is last March, <laughs> and 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 the the other plan B is just to abandon uh, these regions. Uh, you know, to stop delivering food. Uh, to and the have, area can, where the three million people live can, uh, and refugees under a food continue blockade. The, into Russia. Okay. Right. This Again, is something that this the is Western not press also. is not telling you. There are, even according to the UN, nearly a million refugees from East Ukraine that have fled to safety in, wait for it, Russia, their the, the aggressor, aggressor. The aggressor. <laughs> also, the UN has announced this year that. Russia is the number one recipient of asylum applications in the world. Why? Because of Ukrainians from East Ukraine, the people of Donbass, who have applied for asylum from the West Bank regime in Kiev that has been bombing them, okay, mass murdering them. And on top them. of that, I'd like to remind our viewers, go check the New York Times a few weeks ago. There was an article about the few thousand Ukrainian refugees that went to Europe. In the article, there was not one mention of one Refugee well, uh, coming, George. And Gentlemen, I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Ukraine. Stay with RT. Okay, Dima, it's, uh, it's turning into somewhat of a tradition on this program um, because of uh, regulators and some complaints from uh, um, people watching uh, this program. There will be some out there that will say, listening to the first half of this program, that we're just merely repeating Kremlin propaganda. How would you address that complaint or that charge? Uh, well, uh, just recently the EU adopted a special plan on countering Russian propaganda, accusing fabrications and hate speech. Well, of course, uh, reporting that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass discretion was not a fabrication. No, nothing at all. And of course, when Mr. Poroshenko is given standing ovations in Europe, the president of a country in the midst of civil war with 6,000 people, this is not hate speech. You know, when Mr. Poroshenko says he is gearing up for a total war with Russia, and what about this the is children in cellars? What was that phrase? Well, he said, I quote, uh, that their children will rot in cellars. Their means the people of Donbass. And, and, and our children will go to schools and kindergartens. And that is this how is not we will speech. win this war. Okay, Martin, and this is how we will win this my war. Question. So, I mean, I mean uh, uh, accusing us of propaganda when you have such things said and such things done on the other side, you know, addressing what Alexei has just said, I would say that Ukraine is a unique example where actual policy was worse than rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Usually rhetoric is, is worse, but in, in, with Ukraine, the, uh, you know, the, the opposite situation Mark, One of the reasons why I ask this question, because as I see, you know, whatever their plan A was, one day, you know, I would really like to, if we could get an honest, sincere conversation with Victoria Newland to really understand what she tried to accomplish there, if she would ever tell the truth. Um, you know, but the more it goes wrong for those people in those capitals, in Western capitals in Washington, the more they blame Russia for their failed policies. And thus, people watching this program will say, we're regurgitating propaganda when we're actually interrogating every single word they say in action. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, first of all, any, anyone who regularly watches this show, and I, I am a, a frequent guest, thank you, Pete, for having me on for briefly, knows that I'm actually extremely critical of, of Kremlin policy uh, in the Donbass. Uh, perhaps not in the same way the Western press would like me to be, uh, but I don't think that the Kremlin has acted nearly uh, owning up to its responsibilities to protect the people of the Donbass from this West Bank, uh, West Bank 
putsch that has taken power uh, in Kiev. And uh, exactly to that, something not being reported by the propaganda of the Western press, and that is how they do propaganda, by selective reporting, is that the uh, oligarch that is now the, quote, president, unquote, of the regime, uh, uh, Poroshenko, uh, this week put forward a, a request to the Constitutional Court, which he has illegally stuffed with his, his own uh, appointees, um, uh, that the bill that removed the previous democratically elected legitimate president, Viktor Yanukovych, from power was unconstitutional. That is to say that he admitted that his presidency and that everything has, that has happened since the coup on February 22nd of last year is illegal so in the, why, according to the Ukrainian why would Constitution. He do, and why would he do this, and why does he do this okay. now? Why is he doing this now is because the uh, Kiev regime is engaged in a lot of political infighting behind the scenes, particularly between the uh, prime minister that was so backed by the United States, uh, Yatsenyuk, uh, the, the, the ones that they said they wanted to see him in power before the coup even took place. Um, uh, he uh, and many other uh, factions within uh, the, the inner circle of, of these putsch Kabbalists uh, there in uh, Kiev would like to see Poroshenko removed uh, because they would like a bigger share of the power, the money uh, for themselves. And the patronage so, coming so, from so, the West. Right, right, right. He is doing this to protect his own removal under the same kind of uh, abbreviated uh, uh, form of impeachment that was used uh, that completely violates the, the the actual Ukrainian constitution to remove a post facto okay. Yanukovych from power. Well, uh, but you know, that got very little coverage in media, and, and it only got coverage actually in alternative media. I, I didn't see anything in the mainstream, in the main um, uh, papers of record no. on this topic no, whatsoever. This is very selective on the part of Western media when they look at what's going on in Ukraine. What's going on in Ukraine is very complicated um, when you have the IMF breaking its own rules, or seemingly to break its own rules, funding a government that's at war with its own people, uh, funding a, a government that, will, that does not reform, refuses to reform, and then funding a government that would that, be in default. That would be in default, and, and, and it's still controlled by oligarchs. That narrative, the reason why I'm bringing this up, that narrative, and these are all facts that I just mentioned. These are not inventions. These are not fantasies or illusions. And they're but, reported by Western press itself as facts. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but here, forget also one thing that uh, took about uh, IMF and uh, its policy of trying to help and uh, giving Ukraine funding, financing, you uh, simply f uh, forget about that Ukraine works not only with IMF, but with World Bank, with the European Bank of Reconstruction Development, with the uh, European Central Bank. So there is not only one stakeholder, it, but, it's... But it doesn't, it doesn't delay the fact that these institutions, the one I mentioned, the IMF, is breaking its own rules. And that is for political reasons. Because if you look at it in the larger scheme of things, they will, geo, they will break their rules Wait. for geopolitical interests in Ukraine, but they will keep to the rules when it comes to Greece. That is an obvious double standard here. I mean, if you want to actually help these people in both countries, then break the rules equally or don't break them at all. Yeah, but, but don't do different Greece things at the same the time. EU, Ukraine is not. So that's why rules are different, right? What's different? Uh, the Greece is in the Greece EU. is actually a member of the exactly. EU. So and Greece Ukraine should be not. treated better. Yeah, but, but so that doesn't no, normally Greece but, should but be treated that better. No, that, but it is treated no, it has worse nothing to do. It has yeah. no. It has that, that has nothing to do with one or the other because you don't. One is getting money from the IMF. The IMF is not a a a, 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 a element of the European Union. It helps everybody global, in the world. Okay, it's global. Let's talk about well, Russian propaganda I mean, again. Let's go. The the West has continually accused uh, Russia of accusing fascists of being uh, a primary element of the Kiev government and its forces that are killing people in Donbass. Uh, and but we all know this is Russian propaganda that there Except are no for fascists the, the in Kiev. Except for as well. the U.S. Congress. the U.S. Congress, when it took a black progressive congressman, Representative John Conyers, to put an amendment to a bill preventing any funding going yeah. from only the most open and egregiously obvious of the uh, Kiev's National Guard battalions that the U.S. has been training uh, is in, now. In, in Western Ukraine, is training now in Western Ukraine, uh, the Azov Battalion, which openly has uh, uh, SS uh, Panzer Division runes as its symbol, right? Uh, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, you know it's, it's it's founding members are open white supremacists and who are sitting Rada members right now, and it took that 
uh, Representative Conyers to put forward a bill to deny funding to this group. Now, mm -hmm. why? Why has the Kiev regime been having, and again, this is only the most obvious and agreed. So where has Russian propaganda been lying if even the U.S. Congress admits now that fascists have been killing people for this Well, Samantha Powers in invoked, you know, our, our um, what is it, our, our kinder angels, you know, trying to invoke Abraham Lincoln. I thought that was very bizarre. A few Go ahead. bad apples. Peter, Peter, we belong to a generation which saw, uh, still saw how the Soviet propaganda was treated in the West. And it was no, never treated nearly uh, with, with as much hostility as, as the Russian media are treated right now. You know, the Soviet propaganda was, for a number of good reasons, treated uh, with irony. <laughs> so the fact that they are so angry now means that we are probably saying something important that the Western press does report. Because I remember how the Soviet government was angry about BBC and, and Radio Free Europe because they were telling the truth. Okay, gentlemen. But let me, let me give Go you ahead, just one ahead. more example right. about double standards. We all remember how in 2004, when President Putin uh, introduced a system for a time being when he appointed governors, mm -hmm. how the West was saying that oh, this is a, terrible, a this is the end backwards. of democracy. Uh, yeah, yeah. And now Mr. Poroshenko appoints Saakashvili as uh, the governor of Odessa. Even the Western think tanks say that this is crazy. He can't, well, why does it, but, but, but the Western media like, doesn't criticize him. Oh, come on, him. he needs a job. He can't go back <laughs> to his own country because he'll, he'll, he'll be, he'll be, well, able, I know he'll be the, put the in argument, prison. The argument, the usual argument is that Russia is a federation and Ukraine is a unitary state. But didn't we hear from the West uh, in 2004, when Putin started appointing governors, that now that he appoints governors, he should be acting even more responsibly than before and appoint just the people who are not controversial. Well, if Saakashvili is not controversial, <laughs> then I'm not Dmitry Babich. Sa Saakashvili <laughs> is a fugitive from justice his, his in own his country. own country, where he was removed and ran from his country uh, by his own people. It, it, there was a scandal that helped bring his down, where his political opponents, abducted as political prisoners, were being sodomized in prison. And there now, are the videos national, of it, too. National video Public Radio in the United States did a puff article on Saakashvili in Odessa the other day. Not once did they mention that he's a fugitive, fugitive. from justice. All right, gentlemen, we're quickly crimes. running out of time. I want to ask a question. Goldman Sachs has predicted in July of this year that Ukraine will go into default. July 24th. Okay, I want to know what are your reactions to that? Will, be, will Russia be blamed for that, Alexei? For yeah, firstly, just uh, let me come back on uh, the previous issue. So, firstly, uh, the majority of uh, commentators on Ukraine, they majorly uh, only criticize things, and no one proposes anything. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, while we're discussing the past and what happened, why don't we discuss what can what actually happened, be done? What it happened what can, in the past is important, because, it, it, it because is important. of the bill that Mark that just that talked about. If, if Yunukovych wants to protect himself because of a mistake, because of uh, yeah, but it, a, it's a, already happened, a, a so... Illegal, no, but you can't start something off with a with something negative and hope that it'll produce a positive. And this is what you, this is what Poroshenko is worried about. It's going to happen to him again. The, the Pandora's box has been opened. You have more illegal activity. Go, go ahead. Accountability. Mark, One of the biggest U.S. pieces, uh, most famous pieces, of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, propaganda is it's time to move on. Oh, yeah, yeah. With the right? we, we can't with revisit Libya, again, with again, again. It's time to move on. Forget the past. No, it's time for accountability and uh, acknowledgement of what has happened and holding people accountable before international and national law. Go ahead. Well, I don't think they talk about to forget the past. They're talking about move forward. And I mean, we have to move forward. So if we're just uh, we have we'll a road map. Down we have, we have Minsk two point zero. Why doesn't the regime in Kiev? Implement that. That's the roadmap. Exactly. And I mean, uh, as we already discussed, neither Russia nor West, including Europe and U.S., have a uh, plan B. No one has it. Well, okay, gentlemen. So, and we, no one wants we're going to have to end where we started on the Minsk, too. Where it, well, where it's okay. Gentlemen, we've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules. I love you.